So this is most. All right. Whoops. Lane, if you could drop a few of the lights. So I tried to uh, work out a color scheme that might be a little bit more. Um, see, the problem is, is the youth room projector is really close. And so I can use like really deep, dark shades, and it shows up. But I have to be careful up here, and I always forget. Um, Blaine, let's try dropping one more and just see what happens there. Is that better? OK. All right. Well, oh, boy. Oh, boy. OK. <laughs> you know, Blaine thought of doing something funny to pastor this morning, but his comedic timing, he waited too long. And now he's really on top of it up there. He's... <laughs> right. Um, OK. Well, what I wanted to do, uh, for those of you um, who weren't here two weeks ago, um, the way that uh, we'll see how, how things go the, the rest of this year, but uh, the way that Pastor and I were thinking about doing it, um, doing these studies on the unity of the Bible and, and going a book at a time through the scripture and showing how they all fit together, the, the way in which we thought we might approach this is since my since my presentation is kind of more of a broad picture of the whole Bible, and Pastor uh, can tend to narrow in on some of the trouble passages, um, the, the passages that are difficult to understand, we thought maybe it'd be better for me to give the broader picture, and then the following week on the same book, um, for him to add his insights to the broader picture, but also focus on some of the particularities of the book. Um, and if you're familiar with the Genesis account, that seems to be what, what God has Moses do. Genesis 1 is very broad, and then Genesis, Genesis 2 gets very specific in how creation worked out. So it's a biblical scheme uh, that we're following. But uh, So what I, what I want to do is I just want to real briefly go over uh, kind of the broad scheme of things that we went over a couple weeks ago. And so I don't want to spend too much time on this for those of you that were here two weeks ago, but for those of you who might be new tonight, I thought it would be helpful uh, to run through this. Um, so, first of all, a term that, that we introduced a couple weeks ago, go ahead, Peter, was the term meta-narrative, which theologians use to say that this book is essentially one big story. It's a true story, but it's telling one major story. And so the way that I explain this to the high schoolers this morning is, you know, if the, if the Bible was just about keeping laws or keeping rules or following rules, then it would essentially stop with rules. It would end with rules and say, okay, so this is what you're supposed to do. Go do it. But the Bible doesn't end with rules. The Bible ends with a completed story. In other words, it starts out in Genesis telling this, this account of Adam and Eve and creation. And it ends in Revelation about tying up that loose end that began in the fall. So it essentially has a beginning and an end. It doesn't just stop and say, okay, now go do what I told you to. It has an end. So in a sense, we're looking at a, a movie, if you want to say it that way, or a novel that it has a starting point and it has a finish point, and we are somewhere in the middle. So the end of the book doesn't end with us and where we're at. The end of the book ends with the future and how God is going to wrap this whole thing up. And so when we look at this book, it, 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 has, it has a story. It has a, a plot that you follow that, that gets resolved in the end and finds resolution. And so it's important, it's important to consider that, and, and this is a helpful term, the meta-narrative, the big story, okay? And so go ahead, Peter, to the next one. So we've just decided to call it, it's, it's the grand story, and it's true, and it's, you don't let story run amok there and, and be fiction, but this is true, but it's essentially telling one big story. Okay, go ahead, Peter, to the next one. So, at the center of this story is God. He is at the center. This, this book, as uh, Sally Lloyd-Jones said so eloquently uh, a couple weeks ago when I read from the Jesus Storybook Bible, uh, this book is not, about, not essentially about rules and what you should do, but it's primarily about God and what he did. So it's not, it's, it doesn't end with 
uh, just a list. It's not primarily a list of rules. It's primarily looking, look at what God has done, is doing, and is going to do. Look, just look at this picture. And by looking at that, we should be excited to participate in it and, and be part of that, that grand story. So go ahead, Peter, to the next thing. These are the things the Bible's not about. It's not about keeping laws. Does the Bible have laws in it? Yes, it does. It has standards in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But those standards, what we'll find out as we start getting into the law, Exodus begins touching on law, and it'll um, grow and progress in uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But it's not primarily about keeping laws. If anything, we'll see that the laws in the Bible are meant to be received and followed in faith not out of a work, not out of a, a rule-keeping, as much as out of faith. And, and that's going to be a, a discussion point tonight as we begin looking at the laws um, in Exodus. Okay, the next one. The Bible is not about emulating heroes. I'm going to go over tonight the themes that came up in Genesis, because the themes that came up in Genesis will come up throughout the rest of the Scriptures into the New Testament. So, and one of the themes is that God chooses unlikely people, and he chooses imperfect people. And so, it's not primarily about emulating heroes, even though there are some people that did some great things. But essentially, anyone who did anything great in the scripture, it comes back to not their exploits, not something that history says, look at this guy as much as look at this guy's God. Because if, if anybody has done anything exceptional in the scriptures, it is simply to have faith. That's, that's exceptional in the scripture. Other exploits are not. You know, you look at Samson, you say, oh, but look what Samson did. Well, you go to Hebrews, and Samson did that out of faith. It wasn't Samson. It was Samson's great God. And so we always have to remember that God is the main character. God is the main character that, that we are meant to look at uh, in this grand story, okay? So it's not about emulating heroes. And lastly, and there could be more things the Bible's not about, but it's, it's not a bunch of disconnected spiritual thoughts and stories. Um, where's Pastor? Because I'm going to always... Oh, he's back there. Okay, good. Um, I, I said to the high schoolers, I said... You know, I, I give my dad such a hard time after his messages and things. And, uh, and, and it was real easy to give him a hard time until I started seeing that his genes are in me and I start doing the exact same things that, that I get after him for. But I said, you know, I tell Pastor, if we took your sermon and made it into an outline, I said that outline would look like Roman numeral number one, number one, small a, or large a, small a, two small a's, then three small a's, and, and it's, it would make this big outline because he can tend to move. Now, I said, that's okay. That's all right. As long as he doesn't say these words. Now, why was I telling you that? <laughs> because when those words come out, that's a bad thing. Because now we're at, the, we're at the three A's at the bottom of the outline, and we can't remember what Roman numeral one was about. And, and that's when the, the problem arises. And he came in to ask me a question shortly after I told that story. And I, I said it would have been better if he'd come in a little earlier. But, um, and the problem is, is that I'm, I find myself doing the exact same thing, and so I can't laugh uh, and point fingers anymore. But the Bible isn't like that. The Bible, the Bible doesn't get to, the, get to a point and say, but this really is disconnected to the main point. The Bible always ties itself back together. There may be several sub-points, but they're always connected to a main point. And that main point is about God, namely, which is why Jesus says, this is what the Old Testament's about. It can be summed up in two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So the whole Bible is about God. So we love God. It gives us a picture of what an awesome God controls this universe, the only God. And so it's about loving God. And in loving God, we are loving a being that is love. And so as we love this 
being that is love, we begin, that, that love begins to transfer to us and we start loving other people. And so that is, the main, that is the main motif, the main theme. And as we love God and love neighbor, all the glory goes back to God. And so as you can see, I've already mentioned kind of like two major themes in the scriptures. Loving God, or actually three, loving God, loving neighbor, even though Jesus says they're like each other, so they're kind of connected. And then also glory going to God. So you can see those are like kind of subpoints that are all part of one major theme. And so there are subpoints, but they're never, they're never just left out there. They're never disconnected. And so when we read through Genesis and Exodus and we see these different narratives come up, we have to remember the author is not saying, oh, man, this was so cool. I got to include this. It's got, I remember Chuck Swindoll was preaching a sermon. Or he was writing a book about a sermon he preached. And he said, I heard this one illustration, and it really didn't fit in the sermon, but it was so good I couldn't help but tell it. And, and that's not what God does. That's not what the authors of Scripture do. They don't just say, this was, this was cool, it's disconnected, but I'm going to include it. They were purposeful. God is purposeful in everything that's included in the Scripture. So we have to ask ourselves, what, are, what does this have to do with it? That's always a good question to ask, to find how is it connected? What, what point does this serve? How are the genealogies important? We talked about Genesis last week. And as you follow um, pagan, Cain uh, genealogies, you end with Lamech. And Lamech, in Cain's genealogy, is a bad Lamech. He takes two wives. He says, anybody who wrongs me, I'm going to kill him. He's just a very ugly character in Scripture. But then you notice in Seth's genealogy, who does that end with? Lamech, who was the father of Noah. And so you see that the author is doing a comparing and contrast. Notice the line that's not, that it doesn't have God's bless, blessing ends pretty ugly and unattractive. But notice the one that does have God's blessing, Seth, watch his line. And it leads to relief. That's what Noah means. It's like a sigh, sigh of relief. And so uh, this, is, this is the idea. So the authors do not write without intent. And so it's not a bunch of disconnected spiritual thoughts and stories. They are connected. There is a theme. And it's our job to be purposeful and, and diligent to, to find that theme. Okay, so going to the, uh, back to the, the main scheme of things, uh, Peter, take us to the next. So the theme, the, the main character, the protagonist, of this grand story is God. It's about him. It's about him. Okay, so I mentioned last week, and we're just going to scroll real briefly over these, that essentially you can break the Bible down into four chapters. First one, what is it? Shout it out as Peter's going to it. Oh, sorry. Before that, this just supports the point that it's all about God. Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory to him be the glory forever. Amen. So the whole story is from him, it comes through him, and it goes to him. So it's all about, it's all about God. All right, next. Go ahead, Peter. So the first one is creation. And I just mentioned in there that there, there's love between God. God is the protagonist. There is fellowship. There's vision of God. They, they walk with God in the garden. So somehow there's this, this uh, presence of God. And there's perfect dependence, which we discussed last week or a couple weeks ago, is a very healthy thing. It's not something we get away from, it's something we thrive in, dependence. That's our, that's our um, as creatures, we are dependent. And that's, that's an okay thing. That's how we were created. Okay, next. The fall. So in the fall, man gets a distorted view of God. There are broken relationships. The antagonist is introduced. There is the loss of divine presence. They get moved outside of the garden. Adam and Eve introduced the hiding, the darkness motif, which is throughout Scripture that they hide, get away from God, and man has been hiding ever since. Jesus says, light has come into the world, but darkness hated the light because their deeds were evil. Um, and so then in independence is introduced, which Adam and Eve thought sounded attractive, but ended uh, terribly. 
And then Ecclesiastes 7.29 just mentions that God made man upright, but they sought out many schemes, or it can, it can even mean uh, solutions, when there was no solution to be had to look for. Okay, next, third chapter. And so I mentioned that creation is the first two chapters of the Bible, um, is a, third, uh, a, a quarter of the Bible, and then you have the fall, which makes the half of the Bible, and then it's redemption which is the third, if we look at it, is uh, a third chapter of the Bible, and that goes from Genesis 3.16, or 3.15 all the way, or 3.16 all the way through to Revelation. So it's about redemption, and in redemption, you will see faith. Faith, faith, faith. We're really going to hit that tonight, that it's about faith. And you get uh, covenants, you have covenants introduced, which we will find tonight are about faith. You have Christ, which the covenants pointed to, and they were, and Christ is, about faith. So you'll see that the covenants that God gave his people and Jesus were about the same thing. The people that became saved in the Old Testament followed the same scheme, in a sense, as we do today. It's about faith in God and his person, Jesus Christ. So it's, it's all about faith. All right, next. The final, the fourth chapter is consummation. You have the divine presence restored, which was in Eden. Um, you have light, all light. The antagonist is defeated. And you have restored fellowship. So this is the whole story in a nutshell. All the 66 books are telling this big story. Okay, next, Peter, we will go to... So it's about God. Next, next uh, slide. We will go to a short synopsis of Genesis. Genesis was the story of creation, of human disobedience and its tragic consequences, of the beginning of God's redemption story. God's redemption story begins in Genesis 3, 15 and 16, I think it is, where the proto-evangelium uh, is introduced that Satan and his offspring will be defeated. Uh, by the woman's offspring. And so, right after the fall, God immediately responds that I'm going to fix this thing. And, and you got to ask, why was that God's knee-jerk reaction? Why wasn't God's knee-jerk reaction more heavy on the judgment, on the curse? Why in his, in his disobedience, in his discipline in his curse does he give hope why you know why isn't it the end of the story why isn't it the end and what we'll find out tonight and this is so crucial for our theology about god is that god leans more towards compassion than he does judgment that's his character if you want to look at god as more soft than he is hard, God's okay with that. God, God looks, he is a father that loves his child and will do anything to save him, even give his own son. So God leans more towards compassion than he does justice. Now that does not mean that he isn't just. He's just to the point of sacrificing his own son. But God is compassionate and gracious and, and offers steadfast love to a thousand generations, whereas those who hate him, it's to the third and fourth. And so God, God, if you look at a scale, God's heavier on grace and compassion. This is his character. So it's important, it's important to understand. Okay, second, we go to Exodus. The story of Exodus. It's the story of God's faithfulness to a promise he made to restore all things. And we see this in Israel's deliverance from Egypt, her covenant with God, and the presence of God in their tabernacle. So, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide, Peter, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is, our, uh, this is where we're going to close going through each of these points tonight, and we're going to look at different themes that we see in Exodus. Many of these themes, I've added a few that come up in Exodus that maybe weren't seen as, they weren't as prevalent in Genesis. 
Um, but many of the themes that you'll see here are continuations of Genesis, and I'll show you how these themes are continued in Exodus, because these are major themes in Scripture. Um, but we've added a few. Okay, so when we look at Exodus in a, in a nutshell here, the first thing we see, go ahead, Peter, to the next one, is covenants, covenants. Now, Exodus itself flows out of, it is, it is like the roots of the tree are in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And you can even say Genesis 3, 15 and 16, because that's where God initially promises it. But he's really explicit in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where he comes to Abram, chooses Abram, and, and, what, is he, and what does he say to Abram? Go to uh, the next slide there, Peter. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And this is the promise that God makes with Abram to restore creation. This is, this is his forward movement in what he said to Adam and Eve in the fall. What is he going to do? I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. In other words, the blessing is like a cup that's overflowing. It's meant to go to other people, not just to, to be kept in a reservoir of Abram. It's meant to be a reservoir that turns into a river that goes all across the globe. So it is not meant to be held like this. It's meant to just overflow to everyone that they can drink from the fountain. So, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then later, in verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And in 17, 7 through 8, you see this, this continued to Abram's, Abraham's offspring. So it's not just with Abraham, it goes to his offspring as well. And so this is the covenant that God made with Abram. And what was Abram doing when God confirmed all these things to him? He was sleeping, which, which demonstrates that God is the, the prime mover in this. Abram's a participant, but God is the mover and the shaker in this. He, he will get it done. Okay, so what happens after this promise, as you begin reading through Genesis, you start seeing significant things. If you read the rest of Genesis based on Genesis 12, 1 through 3, you'll start noticing things. You'll start noticing that Abram gets really wealthy. So his name is getting great. You'll notice that Sarah, who is barren, has, has a child. And so God is doing the miraculous. He's, he's, doing, he's making him into a great nation, slowly albeit, but he's, he's breaking boundaries that were there. Sarah was barren. Rebecca was barren. And, and he begins moving in this direction. So God is expanding them slowly but surely. And then you see God confirm his promise that he made to Abram to Isaac. He says, I am the God of your father Abraham, and I'm going to be the God to you. I'm going to keep the covenant with you. Then he does the same thing with Jacob. And what you see in these patriarchs' lives is you see that every time they get into a scramble with somebody, whether it was their fault or not, what does God do? If someone dishonors them, God curses them. And so if you begin to read Genesis in light of Genesis 12, 1 through 3, you'll see, oh man, God messing with Pharaoh, God messing with Abimelech for both Abraham and Isaac because of their beautiful wives. That's God keeping his promise to Abraham. Those who dishonor you, I will curse. And so, and then you, there's, there's two passages where you see Isaac is made exceedingly wealthy. Jacob is made exceedingly wealthy. And so you begin seeing that all of this is in reference to Genesis 12, 1, 1 through 3. These aren't haphazard stories. They're all connected. They all have roots, uh, connected to the roots in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. All right, so you have covenants. And what you find out very quickly, and turn in your Bibles to Exodus, and just keep Exodus open because we're going to be flipping through it uh, frequently tonight and just reading verses here or there, kind of like Pastor did this morning with Luke. Um, but what you see very quickly in Exodus, in Exodus 1-7, it says, But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. And you have to ask, 
if I'm reading this passage in light of Genesis 12, 1 through 3, what does it mean that, that Israel is just reproducing like crazy and becoming a great nation? Is that just a disconnected story? No. It is connected back to God's promise that I'm going to make these people a great nation. So you see this. You see this being fulfilled. Look at 224. 224. And God heard their groaning under the, the persecution of the Egyptians. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So, again, this is not a disconnected story. This is God on a mission. God on a mission. And you say, well, man, it took him 400 years to catch up with that mission. Actually, 430 to be exact. You know, God doesn't seem to work on our timetable. And first of all, we say, amen. He doesn't. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So God doesn't look at, he, when he looks at his clock, he doesn't see our watches. He, he has a different timetable than we do. So that's the first thing. But the second thing to, to point out is that way back in Genesis 15, 12 through 14, before Jacob, who was named Israel, ever came into being, God tells Abram, guess what? I'm going, to bless your, I'm going to bless your descendants. But here's what's going to happen to your descendants. They're going to go into captivity for 400 years. That's what God tells Abraham in Genesis 15. So God is well aware of what's going to happen in these 400 years in Egypt. And he says, but don't worry, I'm going to punish the people that have them in captivity. So this 400 years, first of all, is the way God works. He can wait 400, he can wait 4,000, he can do whatever he wants to do. But second of all, God is totally aware of it, and Genesis 15 reminds us of that, okay? So we go on, and we move. Let's just look at uh, Genesis 3.6. I'm sorry, Exodus 3.6. And he said, and he's talking to Moses here at the burning bush, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So this is, this is who God is. He did the same thing to Isaac. He comes to Isaac and he says, I'm, I'm your dad's God. And then he comes to Jacob and he says, I'm your dad's God and I'm your grandpa's God. He, he tells them, remember all those things that your parents told you about? I'm the guy that did that and I'm going to do it with you now. So God is continually apprising each successive generation, here's what's going to happen. You know, you've got the blessing. In case you forgot, in case it, in case it wasn't clearly communicated, you know, you were born into an awesome inheritance idea. And so, and, and, and the rest of these passages all point towards that direction. For some reason, I, I had in my mind, I wanted you to check out 1319. So turn there, 1319. Oh, this is really neat. In 1319 of Exodus, what do we see here? This is how Genesis ended. How, anybody remember how Genesis ended? It's a very depressing ending. Joseph in a coffin. Terrible ending. But what's exciting about that? What did Joseph say about his soon coming death? What did he tell, what did he tell his, his people? Take my bones into the land because I know God's going to fulfill his promise. And that's actually what Hebrew praises him for, for his faith. Of all the things that we think, oh man, Joseph did this. They all came from Joseph's faith. That's where, that's where the strength lies. Not in him, but in the God that gives him that. So, in 1319, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. So it's so awesome. God is moving. He is accomplishing what he promised. He's bringing them into the land. And so they take it with them when they leave Egypt. So God is keeping covenants. Now, let's, let's answer some of these questions. How is God keeping covenant with Israel um, in Egypt? Well, first, we see that he's making them into a great nation. Are there lots of them? Yes. How many came into Egypt with uh, Jacob? Seventy. How many left? 
People guess around two and a half million. So they guessed that we're traveling through the wilderness around there. Incredible, incredible. So you see that these people were uh, having lots and lots of children, moving fast. And you see that in the beginning of Exodus. Okay, so he's making them into a great nation. Next, he makes their name great. Now what I think this has to do with generally is probably like wealth. Making their name great. In other words, people say, man, this is an impressive people. It has to do probably with the wisdom of their law code, which we'll find out soon. And so what do we know? How did, how did Israel get rich? Real quick. God says, look, I'm going to grant you favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, and they're going to give you everything you ask for. Okay? So their name becomes great. We see Genesis 12 fulfilled in that. Bless those who bless you. Is Israel blessed by anybody in the Exodus? Well, there's a couple interesting things that happen. Look at 920. 920 in Exodus. 920. Look at this. This is the plague of the hail. Okay? And look at this interesting verse in 920. Then, so this is Moses saying, hail's coming, you're in trouble. Okay? Then, whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into his houses. So, what you begin to get foreshadowed here is that there were some Egyptians that started to what? Believe. They, we've got early Rahabs here, right? They're seeing it and they're saying, you know what? I'm starting to believe. I'm starting to believe. And so they go out and they, they maybe act in secret and just kind of get their animals in because they, they don't want to, they're like Nicodemus, maybe don't want to lose their, however it happens, but they respond and they put their livestock in. But then look at uh, 1238. 1238. This is during the Exodus. Uh, Israel's leaving, and look what happens as they're walking out. I'll start in 37. And the people of Israel journeys journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides uh, women and children, a mixed multitude. And so that's helpful. When I say two and a half million, that number may have been after the 40 years as they, as they continue, because right here you're envisioning maybe upwards of a million and a half or so with women and children, so, but maybe, maybe more depending on how many kids they had. Um, but, okay, so uh, besides women and children, look at 38. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both with flocks and herds. Who is this mixed multitude? Some of the Egyptians. Notice, are these Egyptians blessed? Very shortly, right? Because what happens to their brothers? They get washed up in the Red Sea, right? And so they, they fall under the umbrella of God's blessing. So those who bless you, and but it all goes back to Genesis 12, okay? And curse those who curse you. Well, that goes without saying, right? I mean, that's kind of the ten plagues. Everybody's cursed. Everybody's in trouble because they mess with Israel, okay? And then um, I had us look at 916. Let's look at 916 there. And this is significant to check out. Because what we see is that God is going to bless all the peoples of the earth, according to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, right? Look at what 916 says. But for this purpose, I have raised you up, and he's talking to Pharaoh here, to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So God, through this occasion, he's raising up Pharaoh as his megaphone to shout out to the globe, he is a major God. He is a force to be reckoned with. And so what we see in the Exodus is we see of another fulfillment of Genesis 12, 1 through 3, that he is using this occasion to blast his name out on a loudspeaker across the universe. And this is, this is part of it, okay? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Another way we see God's blessing uh, and his, his covenant keeping in, in the Exodus, is, you know, what happened to that whole surrounding area? Why, were, why did Israel ever end up going to Egypt? Why did Jacob bring his family to Egypt? 
because of the drought. You can almost look at that drought in a sense of like a second flood. Everybody's dying. Everybody's starving, okay? And I asked the students this morning, what would, what would Pharaoh have done with 70 Israelites whom he didn't even know, probably? And they say, hey, you know, can you give us the best lands in Egypt? Can you feed us with your servants? Can you do all these things? He'd say, see ya. I don't care about you. But what happens if God positions Joseph through all these terrible events to be the number two, really the number one man in all of Egypt? They get the best lands. They get everything. So you see that God is preserving his people through Joseph in, in, the, in this massive drought that overtakes uh, the, at least that part of the world at that time. So you see preservation. And uh, look at 19.6. 19.6. Um, okay, yeah, and this is, this is again, why is God calling Israel as this nation? What are they called to be? 19.6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. What function did the priest serve as? He served for people to come, and he initiated them access to God. He's a mediator. And so Israel, he doesn't want Israel just to be one media, have one priest in a sense, even though that ends up what happening. He wants them to see themselves as a kingdom of priests, which I think carries a more significant idea of for the globe. These were to be the people whom the globe went to, all the people on the globe went to, and they gave them, they showed them access to God. And so you see this. And then uh, finally... Why, why the exodus? Where's God taking them? He's taking them back to where they were, right? Jacob was in the promised land. He left Esau running to Laban out of the promised land. God says, okay, I want you to go back. So Jacob goes back to the promised land. Then the drought comes and he goes to Egypt. Now God's bringing them back to the initial promised land that he, that he promised them. So he brought them out temporarily, probably to keep them safe from the drought. So you see these covenants, and then you see in Exodus a major theme is that God has Israel enter into a covenant with him through the, what? Mosaic law, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now that took me a while, but these other ones we should move relatively quick, quickly through. Okay, another huge thing, uh, a huge motif you see, you see introduced is God's, what? Name comes through in Exodus. He says, Abraham knew me as God, but you're going to know me as Yahweh, right? Which is a, the personal covenantal name. And what we see in 314 is that what is this, what is this name? How, how, do you, how do you communicate this name? It is, I am who I am. I am that I am. And what that name, I think the essence of that name communicates is you cannot put any boundaries on me. You cannot box me in. You cannot domesticate me. I am who I am. That's, that's I think, the strong uh, emphasis on what that name means. I think that's what it communicates. Now, as we get to know God in 33... 17 through 23, this is a significant passage. Paul ends up quoting it in Romans 9 to speak of God's free sovereignty. 33, 17 through 23, I'll read it to you briefly. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that, I have sp that you have spoken, I will do. He wants, Moses wants God to show him uh, himself. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And look at, look at what his name entails. The Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You see, this is God. He will do what he wants to do. There are, no, there are no boundaries for him. And this is significantly communicated in a really poignant passage 
in 32, 10 through 14. And I think this is significant. I, I think that it's, it's not for nothing that this passage is found in the same book that God introduces himself as, I am who I am. Look at what he says in uh, 32, 10 to 14. This is right after the golden calf. Israel sins against God and said, look, Israel, you're God. Okay? 10 through 14, look at what happens after uh, these people. Uh, I'll start in 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Look at, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all that is and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. And so the question is, why include this? And I think Pastor hits the nail on the head when he says, I think God put this in there to show that he is God. And that God has freedom. Now God restricts himself to his covenant because he's a faithful God. But God, in a sense, wants to show, I can do what I want to do. And this is a pretty significant passage, I think, that communicates that. So God's name, we're, God is revealing himself here. Okay, next. Name is a significant. Holy war. Holy war. This was seen in Genesis that the holy war init was initiated between God and Satan and his descendants. Who are Satan's descendant descendants? Everybody that's opposed to Christ, right? I mean, you get to 1 John, and he says, look, there's many Antichrists out there. The spirit of the Antichrist is out there. What does that mean? Well, it's the people that are opposed to Christ, I think, are, are his, his descendants in that way. So you have this holy war, and it's continued with Moses and Pharaoh, God and Egyptians' gods. And what, what is significant there? Look at, just look at a couple passages. We're not going to look at all these, but look at 12.12. And you can just listen as I read if you're more comfortable with that. I'm turning to them really quickly for sake of time. In 12.12, um, he says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. Look at On all the gods of Egypt I will ex execute judgment. I am the Lord. Another plague where, where God, uh, and it's actually the one where he strikes down the firstborn. It's, it's a little further on, I think. But he said, I'll, I'll kill all the firstborns in Egypt, but not even a dog will approach an Israelite. In other words, God is continually, look at the, the darkness plague. The darkness is all in Egypt, but what happens on Israel's side of things? It's light can see. So what God is continually doing here is he's painting a very thick contrast between Egypt and Israel. And it's, it is this holy war motif that is against other gods. Look at, uh, just real quickly, 11, 4 through 9. What does he say in 11, 4 through 9? So Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. Oh, and this is the passage I was just talking about. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And so, if you read, if you follow pastor's advice and try to read through Exodus in one sitting, what you will see continually is this, that they may know 
that I am God. That they may know that there is no one like me. That they may know, that you may know, it is God constantly elevating himself about, above all other false deities. Okay, significant. Next. Remembrance. This is what we spent all morning on in the, in, with the students. I'm trying to split it up so they don't hear the same thing all the time. Um, but we, we, this is the one that I thought would be really significant for them. And what you see in all these passages is you see this God who cares about <clears throat> the next generation. Everything God does, he says, do this so that when your children, that when your sons ask you, why are we doing this? You tell them this. So that when your children ask you, the Passover, you know, I, I mentioned to the kids that in the, in the future generations, God still had them pull the tunic up through their legs and tie a sash around, which is what the men would do when they were ready to run or to walk fast. And God had them do that. I told the students, it would be like, if you're, uh, you know, let's just, let's just say communion. We're coming to communion to church. And every dad says to their kids, okay, listen, I want you to put on your running shoes for church today. Dad, I'm not running anywhere. That's basically what it was. Because this is how it was in Egypt when we left that night. It was fast-paced. We were moving. And so it's all about the next generation. Turn real quickly to Psalm 78, 1 through 8. and Because I, I, I want to really knock this down deep. Um, and again, as you're turning there, you think of the manna. I was telling the students this morning, it's so significant. How long did the manna last that God gave them in, in, uh, as they were traveling through the wilderness? A day, except for on the weekend, and it lasted two days, right? And, you know, when God has them gather it up, he has them take an omer of it, tie it up, however they did it, and keep it for how long? The next generations. And you say, I thought this stuff only lasted a day. Two days tops. But God is, look at if he can put this flake, these flakes on the ground, he can make them last however long he wants to make them last. But why? for future generations, so that they can look at these things and see them, okay? But look at Psalm 78, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8 here. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from the old, things that we have heard and known, that your fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, and his might, and wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, now catch this, so significant, so that they should set their hope in God. So, so significant. The law is about setting your hope in God. It is not about fulfilling the requirements of the law as a work of your own flesh. It's as a result of putting your hope in what God has given in his law. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's move to the next one. But you see this majorly, pass it on to the next generation. Very briefly, God continues to choose the unexpected. Why is Moses an unexpected choice to lead Israel? What do you think? Why is Moses, Moses, people might say, a poor choice? That's right. Good. What else? Some people might say that's the best qualification, though, you know, when they don't trust themselves. What's that? Break, breaking so far protocol. Okay, good. He was a murderer. He was, a, he was on the run, a rebel on the run. Okay, what else? What's that? 80-year-old shepherd. Yeah, I read somewhere that at the burning bush, maybe he was 40, but I couldn't confirm that. But yeah, when he approaches Pharaoh, he is 80 years old. And of course, this is after the flood when people didn't live as long as they used to. So yeah, he's up there. He's up there in age. Good. Anything else? Yeah, he, 
it was, whether he was a stutterer or whatever, but God doesn't say he doesn't have a problem. When he says, God, I have a problem, God, God basically confirms it by saying, who made mouths? Who made limbs? Who made all these things? So God doesn't say, no, you don't, Moses. You're just making excuses. So apparently Moses had a legitimate complaint that he had problems problem with speech. Okay, good. Anything else? What's that? All right, the Jews didn't like him. He's coming back, and they say, man, you caused trouble for us. All right? Another significant thing is, who's he married to? He's not married to a Jew. Yeah. So, you know, he doesn't quite fit the mold that you might think, and yet God chooses him. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Moses' imperfections here in a second. Next. But again, that's, that's what God does. He's constantly choosing the unexpected. Why? 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. To show that it's all about him and what he can do with the unexpected people of this planet. So that everyone doesn't look and say, well, yeah, it's him. They look at them and say, man, I'm boasting in the Lord because it surely is not, not this guy. Okay. Um, another one, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but... God establishes his presence. Remember, it was lost in the Garden of Eden, right? And now God is bringing his presence back. He shows up to Moses at the burning bush. He comes in the pillar of cloud and fire, which we begin to see in Isaiah that that was actually the Holy Spirit coming into the picture. Um, He visits the elders, and they basically dine with God in Exodus 19. Um, He shows himself to Moses. And then this is, I mean, basically the end of Exodus a very large part of Exodus is all devoted to what? The building of the tabernacle, which the significance of the tabernacle is it is where God will manifest his presence. It's where the cloud will come down. So what you see is what was lost in Eden is in a certain fashion coming back again. God's presence, God's presence is there. So that is majorly a significant point. So you have to ask yourself, when you're you're caught in the humdrum of the tabernacle, Okay, so, oh, what is the significance of this? Just get to it already. And I think the significance is why does it get so much attention in Exodus? Because God was to get a lot of attention in Israel. So he spends a lot of time on where he was going to show up. And I think that you got to ask, why is there so much time on this? Sheesh, that's why. Okay. Next, so presence is a major theme. All right, and then I said we'd come back to this. Moses, an unremarkable saint. <laughs> so we mentioned several of the things. One of the, so he was an outlaw. He was married to a non-Jew. He stuttered. Um, he, he's fearful, right? He, he's on the run after he, after he kills. He doesn't want to go into God's service. Does Moses have an anger problem? We see that. He's got an anger problem. Is Moses stubborn? Four times he says, God, no. Choose somebody else. So he's stubborn. It says God got very, very angry at him in his, in his unwillingness. He's a stubborn guy. Okay, and This is very significant. You, you read through Exodus and you come to this one passage and you're like, where did this come from? But in 424 to 26, I think it is. Is that? Yeah, I don't have it up there. 424 to 26. You're reading, and it says, out of nowhere, and God was coming to kill Moses. It just like pops up. And you're like, huh? And in the midst of those two verses, his wife, I think Zipporah, runs over and circumcises his son. And God stops. In two verses, you get this really weird passage. So get this. The person who God is calling to lead Israel hasn't even circumcised his own boy. Crazy. And and this this is God's leading servant. So again, Moses is imperfect, and yet God does miraculous things with this guy. But is it about Moses? No. It's about Moses as God. Okay? All right, next, and this is, uh, this is our second to last one, and we'll be done in about five minutes here. But I'm just going to plant a seed here because this is going to get developed throughout 
the rest of the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, the Torah. The law of Israel, the law of Moses, gets such a bad rap as bad news. One commentator said, you know, I think people like the New Testament because they think the New Testament's all about good news. And the Old Testament's all about law, and so it's all about, like, bad news. And these are, these are two passages that are too significant to leave here without reading. So, if you've got your Bibles, just turn to these two passages. We're almost finished, and uh, we're going to look at these two real briefly. What, how was the law of Moses, that God gave Moses, how was it to be received? Was the law strictly to condemn? I would answer no and yes. See, the law was meant to be received not with the flesh, but with faith. It was not meant to be handled in the flesh. That's how Israel did it. And that's why it got messed up. That's why the system malfunctioned. It wasn't because the system was flawed. It's, it's because the person was flawed. They looked at the laws and said, yeah, we can do that. They say it all through the, the Pentateuch. We will do that. We will obey. Our house is the Lord's house. We'll do it. But what you begin to see is that they didn't have it in them. They did not have it in them, which is the significance of the new covenant. God would give it to them. But look at, look at these two significant passages, Romans 9, 30 to 32. What shall we say then, Paul says, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Why did Israel not succeed? Because they did not pursue it by faith faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is the idea. And, and we'll, we'll flesh this out more in the weeks to come. But people were to received the law in the exact same way that they received Christ. Catch that. They were to receive the law in the same way that people received Christ. The people that denied Christ were the same people that denied receiving the law in faith. They looked at it as a work system and so handled it poorly. Were people saved in the Old Testament? How? How? They were. We know they were. You have uh, Simeon and Anna. They seem like believers to me. How? How were Old Testament saints saved? They were saved by putting faith in the system that God had set up, which pointed to Christ. That's how, that's how they were saved. They were not saved by keeping the law. They were saved because they didn't keep the law. Everybody fell, but God provided repentance through a system that all pointed to Christ. And so when you have Christ come, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. I was talking with pastor this afternoon. The way that I understand it is that the law was like a skeleton frame. You know, you look in anatomy class and you start with a skeleton, okay? That was the law. That was the structure. Jesus is skin and blood and ligaments and brains on that structure. So you have this law that was filled up in Christ. So Christ called people to the same thing the law did. He called them to faith. Faith in Him. And saying that having faith in the law is essentially saying faith in Christ. Christ says, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. So otherwise you can't have the psalmist, you can't have people in the Old Testament saying, I love the law. The law is right. The law is just. The law is pure. You can't have people saying that if the law was, was just this, this bad system that was to come to an end. It is a perfect system that is pointing 
to Christ who fills out the system and shows you what it was meant to be. So the people that, that looked at the law and then looked at Christ and said, he doesn't look anything like the law. They misunderstood the law. Christ was the perfect fulfillment. He's the, the teleos, as pastor says, and the scriptures say, of the law. He was the perfect fulfillment of it. So the people who saw this contrast between Jesus and the law misunderstood the law. Jesus was the law. He was it incarnate. He was perfect. So that's, that's crucial to understand. And then real briefly, Hebrews 4.2, and we'll, we'll get into more of that discussion uh, in the weeks to come. But Hebrews 4.2, For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united in faith with those who listened. And so, listening to the law, it didn't have to do with faith. It had everything to do with their strength. Okay, moving on to our last one. Christ in Exodus. And I'm just going to scan over these. Christ in Exodus. John 1.14 says that Christ came, and the Greek word is, and tabernacled among us. And so it's the idea that Christ, again, he is the tabernacle, he is the law, he is the temple. Jesus says, tear this temple down, and I'll raise it up in three days. Is he talking about the physical temple? He's talking about his body that will be resurrected. So Jesus, Jesus is everything the Old Testament talks about. He's that. So um, he tabernacled among them. Matthew 2.15, uh, Matthew quotes Hosea that um, out of Egypt I called my son, and Jesus was in Egypt and then comes out. Pastor may talk more about that next week. But again, it's, he's kind of a type, Israel's a type of him coming out of Egypt. Um, Luke 22, 20, and Exodus 24, 8. Jesus offers the new covenant. And so he gives what the old covenant didn't have as much of. And this is kind of a difficult thought. The Old Covenant. Did people get saved under the Old Covenant? They did. How many? Not many. What are they referred to as throughout the Old Testament? The, the remnant. The remnant. Just a few people. There's not many. I think in Elijah's day there was like 7,000. So it was just a small portion. Why? Because God did not grant them with as much generosity as he does with the New Covenant. So there was, under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, there were people that were saved, that were regenerated in that sense, but not nearly as many as will happen when the New Covenant is established. And this is when God says, a new time is coming, that I'm going to write the law on their hearts. And this is what Jesus offers in Luke 22:20. 20, and it's so much like the Passover when he says it. It's, it's almost like quoting Exodus 24, 8 verbatim. This is a new covenant. This is for you. And this is, this is what he does. Okay, so let's see. Um, Luke 9, 30 to 31. I don't know why I put that in there. Let me, let me look real quick. Luke 9, 30 to 31. Oh, yes, it's the transfiguration. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which is the Greek word for exodus. And so Jesus, in that sense, is like the forerunner ascending to heaven in which we will follow. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 1 through 7. Let me just go over that real briefly. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 7. For I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And so, what you see is that there's all of these things that Christ is to be our spiritual nourishment. And we receive that with faith. And it very, you know, break it down. 
if you go through life as a worrier, you are essentially no different than Israel that doubted Moses at every turn and doubted God at every turn and said, where's the water? Did you just bring, it out, bring us out here to die of thirst? Where's the food? Did you just bring us out? And this is after God parted the Red Sea. This is after God did all these things. They just continue to doubt him, continue to doubt. And that's not what Christ does. When you have trust in Christ, you don't spend your life doubting. You're like Israel and, let me say, unregenerate Israel. And so it doesn't, it doesn't mesh. Revelation 15.3 is so cool because it says, and they sang the song that Moses sang when they crossed the Red Sea. In Revelation, in heaven, we will be singing the song that Moses and the Israelites sang as they crossed the Red Sea. So again, these bookends. And then Hebrews 11.22-29 celebrates Moses' Moses' faith in counting it more precious to be persecuted with Christ and Israel than to be counted as the king, um, the king's son in Egypt. And so what you see is you see the people that were saved, it was as a result of their belief in a great God. The one exemplary thing these Old Testament saints did was simply have faith, have faith. One thing I didn't put in here that I'm reminded of is Moses' face comes down from the mountain. 